All right, today's message again, the angel and the girl. John the Baptist's birth was foretold by an angel, the angel Gabriel, and he spoke to this elderly priest named Zechariah and scared him. And he appears before Zechariah and says, your prayers have been heard. And we focused last week on the fact that God Here's your prayers. When we just prayed right now, God in heaven was listening. When you're taking a shower and you're thinking about the day and you start to pray, God is listening. When you're driving your car and your eyes are wide open because you're paying attention to your driving, but you're talking with the Lord, God hears your prayers. God hears our prayers. And, uh, but Dad pointed out, Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth, they had actually probably, because they were stricken with age, They'd probably given up praying for a child a long, long, long time ago. From God's perspective, he always planned to keep that promise. He, he, he planned to answer their prayers. But it wasn't in the timing they expected, certainly not in the way they expected. And uh, here he was, still faithful, still serving, probably thinking, well, you know, some of our prayers God's answers, some of our prayers God says no. Apparently God's not, who, who? You know, expects to have a child at that age. But God heard their prayers, and he gave them a little boy, and he said, he's going to be a source of joy. You are just going to be so, you're going to rejoice. And many people rejoice over the birth of this child. This is a beautiful picture of a faithful couple. One of the things I love to see in life is, uh, is an old warrior, an old uh, person who's been s serving Jesus all their life, who have been living out a life of faith, in the good times and the bad times, I love to see couples that have stood the test of time. Couples that are together, not because life is easy, but because they're putting the Lord first in their lives. And, and you see a, an old gal and this old guy, and they, they want to honor Jesus with their lives. They want to do what's right. They want to be an example and living good lives. This, this old couple, this, this priest and his wife, they prayed. They were still praying. They were still serving. This wasn't just a something they went through when they were a teenager or a young adult or we have kids, so let's go to church. But when we don't have kids and we don't go, I love to be around the example of old warriors, people that have battle scars and wounds because life is hard. There is no... We always think, well, other people's lives are so easy and mine's so difficult. You're sitting in a room of people that have a lot of scars, some of them self-inflicted. Life is difficult. Life is hard. This is a world of tears. Thank goodness we have a God who loved us enough to come down into this darkness to offer us salvation. But this is a hard world, a sad world. And when I see two people that are still together, still holding on to each other and holding on tight to Jesus, that is something that, is something that puts a, a awe in me. And I want to learn from them. This couple... Don't ever think for a moment they had less troubles than anybody else. But they walked through their troubles and they brought glory to God. Again, what do we always say? Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. And listen, if you're going through it without God, your trouble, you know what it is? Is, is just trouble. That's all it is. There's nothing special. There's nothing sanctified about it. You just go through trouble, you suck air until you're dead. If you want to honor God in your life, sure, you still have trouble, you have hardship, you have heartache, you have disappointment, broken dreams, physical ailments, relational difficulties, things not the way they're supposed to do, be because this ain't heaven. But now your trouble is an opportunity. Your trouble is an opportunity to walk through it in a way that is going to put a spotlight on Jesus Christ in a way that's going to bring glory to him. And we've said this many times, there are some things you can't do in heaven. You can't evangelize in heaven. There ain't nobody unsaved in heaven. You can't give sacrificially of your time, your talent, your tithe in heaven. And in heaven, you will not be able to say, God, I'm going to suffer. I'm going through suffering. I'm going to do it in a way that pleases you. Because I'm want to. i not going to use my suffering as an excuse 
to be bitter. I'm not going to use my suffering as an excuse to badmouth other people. I want, to, I want to glorify you through this. And you can't do that in heaven. So if we're ever, ever, ever going to walk through hard times in a way that brings glory to Jesus, might as well start now. This old couple had all the scars that everybody has going through this world. And yet, even as an old age, they're praying and they're serving and they're trying to glorify God's, God in their lives. Let's be wise. And I, I want to encourage everyone to have a lookout for those who are ahead of you uh, in age or uh, in, in, walking with, in age of walking with the Lord. Watch those who are standing the test of time, the people whose faith has stood the test of time. Be smart enough to learn from those who have already raised godly children. Be smart enough to learn from those who are still walking in their faith after years of pain in a fallen world. You know, foolish people don't learn from their mistakes and they don't learn from other people's mistakes. It takes a little bit of wisdom to learn from our own mistakes. That's actually hard to do, harder than it sounds. You know, I hit my head in the wall and what I do is turn around and say, well, let me try that again. Ooh, still hurts. Maybe this time it won't. Ooh, still hurts. Uh, but then a, a wiser person yet can learn from other people's mistakes and wounds and battle scars. Of course, you know what's best of all is we just say, hey, you know, I think I'm going to do the right thing. I don't need to see anybody hurting. I don't, need to, I don't need to hurt myself, and I don't need to see anybody else hurting. Let's be wise, and we can learn uh, from watching other people's walk. What, what did they do that helped them get through the? How did they hold on during those sleepless nights? How did they hold on when they were worried about their kids, about their finances? Who's still walking in their faith? Watch, listen, learn. Who has joy? Listen, I don't care how much Bible you know. If you don't have joy, pay attention to the person who has joy and learn. Be humble and learn. Who has peace? Not the person who's always complaining. You don't need to learn from them. Who's the person who has peace in their life? Learn. Who is giving? Who, is, who knows how to give joyfully of their time and their gifts and their talents to the Lord? Learn from that person. Who is still actively sharing their faith? Pay attention. Stay awake. Who is actively sharing their faith even after years? It's not something they went through in college and now they're done with it. Who is sharing Jesus to those around them? Uh, I'm embarrassed, Bob. Bob gave his three-minute testimony this week to somebody that needed to hear it. Yeah. yeah. You know what, Bob? I needed to encourage these people more than I needed to please you. Bob said, don't embarrass me. Oh, well. You, you and the Lord, you're going to deal with it. You're getting used to it. There's more where that came from. And I've got the mic. Uh, who, is, who is walking in patience, even towards their pastor when they embarrass you? Uh, who is trustworthy? Listen, God wor values a trustworthy person. They don't have to swear. They don't have to sign a paper. They say they're going to do something, and you know they're going to do it. And they're dependable, and they're there. They're at the Bible studies. They're at church. Who's there? Who, is, who can you depend on? Who is humble? Jesus said he's humble, and he said, learn from me. Learn from people that are walking in humility. Not boastfulness, not pride, not anger, not bitterness. Learn. And I look at this old couple... And it's beautiful. Don't you want to? Don't you want to be walking strong for the Lord even when you're well stricken with age? Right up to the end. The old priest and his wife, we can just call them Zach and Beth, right? Zach and Beth are models of faithfulness. God looked at them, and when God from heaven looked down, you know what the Bible said? He said, they are righteous in my sight. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? They are righteous in my sight. He said their walk was blameless. They walked blamelessly before him in this dark world. Now, that doesn't mean they were without sin. God's got his grace goggles on. That's the only glass, glass, glasses he has, by the way. God's always looking through the eyes of grace. But God was seeing their direction, not their perfection. And these were people that were living for him. And he looks down and says, look at them. 
Not that they're sinless, but look at their lives. They want to live for me. They're making these choices. They're walking blamelessly before him. And God put the stamp of approval on him. And now you know Zach and Beth because he not only approved of them, he not only gave them the privilege of raising John the Baptist, he put them in the Bible so all of you and I could learn from their example. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Today, we're going to shift gears. We're talking about an old married couple, and we're going to look at an encounter with this same mighty angel, Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Lord, and he's going to meet somebody else, this time a little girl who's not yet married, although she's engaged, a little girl named Miriam or Maria or Mary. We're going to shift gears from this amazing temple that King Herod built, one of the wonders of the Roman world, unbelievably beautiful, unbelievably richly ornated, to a humble home in a small town of Nazareth. Angel Gabriel goes to this high place this priest, not a high, it goes this priest in this great mighty temple in this capital city of this ancient realm. And then he goes to this little town, to a little home where there's a little girl. Mary was not wealthy. But in fact, by our standards, we would consider her poor, but maybe not by the standards of her day. We don't know. She was a, a member of an oppressed people group. The Jews were occupied by the Roman Empire, treated unfairly. They were ruled by a puppet dictator. So it's not only a dictator, but he's a puppet of the mighty Roman Empire. We know that Mary was a virgin, which was the phrase for a young girl. She had lived a good life. She was not a loose girl. But after the birth of Jesus, she and Joseph would go on to have at least six children. James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and we know at least two daughters. Matthew 13, 54 says, He came to his hometown and began preaching to them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Means at least two, right? Are they not all with us? Where did, not, where did this man get all these things? So Mary was a mama that was blessed with a lot of children. Many people believe that for a good chunk of her life, she was also a single mom. Because it seems as if Joseph must have died young because he's mentioned at the beginning of Jesus' life. Of course, he had, you know, seven plus kids. But after that, we don't hear from him. We see Mary and we see the brothers. Uh, Mary was always following Jesus. She didn't always agree, you know, take care of yourself, son. She wanted him to come home and rest. But we see that Jesus' brothers, they did not put their faith in him as the Savior of the world to after he resurrected. It's just hard to believe your brother is God in flesh. After he resurrected from the dead, it convicted them. They realized, you know what? We've been awful hard on him. We didn't believe him. But when did he ever sin? It was us that was critical of him and judgmental of him. After Jesus rises from the dead, his brothers do put their faith in him, and some of them actually become leaders in the early church. But Mary, for a big part of her life, didn't have her beloved Joseph. Isn't that sad? All during the time of Jesus' public ministry, no Joseph. Imagine that. Mary is a godly woman. God, I'm doing things right. You sent an angel to me. You bless me. And now you're going to take my husband away? How do you think that felt for Mary? Married to a godly man. Both of them were able to hear from God, both of them knowing that he would grow up to be something special. They talked about it. Our son is special. Imagine what he's going to grow up to be. Of course, they wanted to see it together. Mary knows, Mary seems to know that Jesus could do miracles because apparently, uh, you know, when, when Jesus was at the wedding at Cana, remember that? She says, and the wine is running out, she says, why don't you go do something about it? Why are you talking to me, woman? But <laughs> I think it was supposed to sound better in their language than it does in our language. But, but she knew Jesus had this miraculous power, and I'm sure she and Joseph wanted to see what Jesus would become together. 
And when Joseph died, however he died, we don't know. Carpentry accident, got a chisel and... <laughs> I don't know. That was a little graphic. That was not even in the notes, by the way. But I don't know. You're hitting on a hammer and... You know, <laughs> however he died, sickness, ailment, don't you think that Mary prayed? And she's got the Savior of the world in her house. And Jesus didn't heal him, apparently. Didn't raise him from the dead. Think about that. Mary was intelligent. She was a brilliant young lady. Uh, we're not going to get it today, but she has this song that she writes called the Magnificat that is just beautiful. It's an, she sings it. She composes it. It's not some cutesy, simple, teenage, teeny bop song that you might expect from a teenager. It's a song about faith. It's a song about thankfulness, justice. And there's this strong assurance in the goodness of God throughout this song that this young lady writes. I keep saying young lady, little girl. She was also very, very young by our standards. In that day and age, everyone tended to marry very young. Few people married after their 20s. Most everybody married in their teens. Mary could have been, when she was engaged, as young as 12. Uh, most girls probably married around 15, 16, 17, and usually the guys were a year or two older. Uh, after, shortly after this time, the Jewish rabbis actually set it in stone that to get engaged, a girl had to be 12 and a boy had to be 13, and they usually waited a year. But, uh, so she could have been as young as 12, but maybe around 15, 16. So she was a young lady, a woman without wealth or social status. There was nothing from a worldly point of view special about her. Let's look now in Luke chapter 1 to see how maybe God looks at things differently than human, human culture does. Luke chapter 1 from verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, remember that's the priest's wife. She's going to have John the Baptist. God sent the angel Gabriel again to Nazareth to a town in Galilee, which is a region that's very heavily influenced by Greek culture, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Maria. The angel went to her and said, Ave Maria, greetings, you who are highly favored. Do you just see what happened there? This young girl, how much, how much respect did a young girl from a poor family get in a culture like that? God sends an angel, an angel who stands in the, his presence, and the angel appears before and says, Hail, this is, this is like Hail Caesar, right? Hail Maria, you who are highly favored. God is looking down from heaven. God is looking down from heaven. He says, oh, I like the way that girl is doing things. Look at her. She's mature. She's living a life of faith. She's a girl with love in her heart. God looks down. He puts his stamp of approval, just like he did on that old couple. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, he sees a young woman. Uh, Emma, how old are you? 14. Chia, how old are you? Megu? 16. Aiko? 13. God's looking down from heaven at these young ladies. And when we're making these right choices and living for him, God says, I approve of that. God loves to see it. Girls, ladies, young women, Piper, isn't that so nice? Peace to you too. Isn't that three? Okay. Oh, nice. Three years old. Isn't that so nice that God is looking and when you're living for Jesus, he says, I like that. My stamp of approval on that. This angel appears before Mary and says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. That's where we get that song Ave Maria from, right? The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words. If she was an American girl, she'd say, What? <laughs> 
She was greatly troubled at his words. I refuse to believe Mary would have said that. And wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, again, because that's what angels do. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His reign will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Then listen to this. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me according to your word. Then the angel left her, and that right there, I am the Lord's servant, may it be to me, according to what you have said, is the reason why God looked down and saw this is a woman of faith. This is a mighty woman. She's, she's far greater than her years. This is a woman who is humble and willing to accept my will for her life. Mary was highly favored in heaven. Don't you want to be highly favored? Don't you want God to look down and say, I like, I approve of what you're doing in your life? What was it about her that God saw as praiseworthy? And how do you respond, brothers and sisters, how do you respond when life doesn't go your way? She was engaged, this young man, this fellow named Joseph. I'm sure they had plans. Don't you think they mapped out a life together, what they want to have happen? Probably being miraculously caused to be with child by the Holy Spirit was not on their list. Probably God called her to do something that was going to make her unpopular with her family and her neighbors. Who's going to believe her story? In fact, maybe brothers and sisters didn't even believe her story until after Jesus rose from the dead. Then, oh, Mom was telling the truth all along. How do you respond when you have plans and they're swept away? Unexpected difficulty because blowing in like a hurricane and all the things you had planned and dreamed of, it's gone suddenly and you're standing there saying, well, what now? What next? When my plans are dashed, when... When my image, my self-image that I've worked so hard to craft over the years takes a blow, when my life that's set on a path that I had ch uh, chosen is set on a new path that I didn't choose, how do I respond, especially if, you know what, deep down inside, I blame God. Deep down inside, I think this is his doing. If I wasn't following Jesus, I could have my own image. Now he's asking me to do these things that take me out of my comfort zone. You want me to praise you? You want me to tell other people about you? But I've worked so hard at crafting this image. And now you need to break it and remake me so I'm more useful to you? This is what I wanted to do with my life, and you're calling me to be a missionary? This is what I wanted to do with my life, and you say I have to give up this Saturday to come clean the church or to come serve with some children's ministry? And God shifts our life dramatically. Lord, this is your fault, isn't it? And he says, yeah. I'm your God. And I am calling you on this path. How do you respond? You know, we can often guess and we can blame God for things maybe he's not responsible for, but Mary didn't have to guess, did she? An angel stood right in front of her and spoke plainly, and her life was shattered in a moment. And her response reveals this incredible character, this beauty, this inner strength. 
her humility. She said, I am the Lord's maidservant. Actually, the phrase literally is doulos, which means slave, sometimes translated bond slave, which was a voluntary slavery, a voluntary submission. She said, let it be done to me just as you have said. Lord, I'm sitting here in the hospital. Let it be done unto me according to your will. Lord, I don't like the situation I'm in right now. Let it be done unto me according to your will. This is what faith looks like. This is what faith looks like. Faith is not willing God to do what you want. Faith is not willing God to do what you want like you're some freaking Jedi and he's the force. And I'm going to will God, you will give me. That is not faith. That's superstition. That's magic trying to manipulate God somehow. Faith is receiving, willing to receive, willing to accept what comes from the hand of the Lord. Humble ourselves to the mighty hand of the Lord. I'm not saying we can't pray for a different outcome. God tells us to pray. And God sometimes answers those prayers. God, please heal my sister. Please heal my brother. Sometimes God says, yeah, that's part of the plan. I'm going to do that. God, give me an opportunity to share my faith. I'm, I've been wanting to share with these people forever. I'm not going to just sit here. Be active. And God may provide an opportunity for you to talk about the cross, talk about what Jesus is. How has Jesus changed your life? And now you can tell your family about it. You can tell your coworkers about it. You can tell your neighbors about it. Don't just sit there like a lump. That's not what I'm talking about. Jesus himself, before he went to the cross, he went to the cross. He willingly submitted himself to that plan. But didn't he pray, God, if there's another way, I'll take that. Pray. And it's not that God's changing his mind or changes. People, people try to play these theological games. Well, if God can change his heart, mind, then he's not really. No, no, no. Listen, before there was nobody praying. Now the situation is somebody's praying. The situation has changed. God will respond differently sometimes because the situation is different. <clears throat> so I, please understand, I'm not saying just be a lump. Whatever comes, comes. Get out there. Strive to do what's right. Pray, pray, pray. But at the end, have enough faith that if God doesn't do things like the way Dan Wolf wants them or the way you want them, that we will be humble enough to say, I'm going to walk with Jesus when the hurricane blows my life away. I'm going to walk with Jesus when all my plans and all my dreams are put at an end. I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate faith like that old couple with all those battle wounds, and like this young gal at the beginning of her life, I'm going to demonstrate faith when life didn't go my way. And they waited. After years of praying for a little child, they waited all those decades. And she, just a few years of being able to demonstrate a faithful life, and God gave her this tremendous responsibility and also said, a sword's going to pierce your heart. Your heart will be broken by this little boy. and yet walking with faith. Isn't this incredible, beautiful story? And think about this right here at the beginning of Luke. Luke, this investigative detective, says we got to tell the story because he talks more about the birth of Jesus, about the situation with Mary, than the other Gospels. And we've got this little girl who walked in faith. We had this old couple, and now we have this little girl, and God says, I approve, I approve. Aren't you desperate? Don't you want God to approve of your life, of your choices? Lord God, please make our lives count. We want to live for you. We want to do things your way. Count me a card-carrying member of Maria's fan club. And I, you know, sometimes I worry that we're, sometimes we react so uh, strongly against uh, the excesses of of uh, Catholicism in this area that we forget to say, this is a woman who modeled faithfulness. And young girls, uh, what, my mom's na middle name is Maria, and one of the reasons I named Chie, her middle name is Chie Maria, because it sounded like Ave Maria, Chie Maria. And uh, that's from mom, and that's also because Mary, this is a beautiful girl, 
And I was thinking, when I was writing this sermon, I was thinking of Emma and, and, all, and my girls and all the little kids in this church. Girls. Girls. Be like Maria. Be like Miriam. Be like Mary. Live a life of faith. Live a life that matters. Well, let's uh, talk with Jesus. Let's ask him to stir up our lives. Let's talk to the Father. Let's pray. Dear God, Father, I pray that everyone in this church, every single one of us, will bow before you in humility and we'll say, God, we're yours. We are yours without reservation. We're, we're yours, Lord, when life is good and it's fun and we're, we're surrounded by people we love and we're enjoying you and we're enjoying our lives, Lord, and we are yours when the hurricane blows through and there's nothing left of all of our plans and all of our dreams, Lord. And Lord, we're yours. Father, we're your servants I pray that each one of us in our hearts can say, I am the Lord's servant. May it be done unto me according to your will. Lord, I want to surrender myself to your will. Lord, I pray that this church is always a church that's eager to surrender itself, Lord. That we want to surrender ourselves, Lord, to your will. Lord, help us to be people that are easily corrected, people that are easily taught, Lord, people that... Stop struggling and striving against you, Lord. Father, please, I want to pray especially for the young women in our church, especially the teenagers. Lord God, please send your Holy Spirit powerfully to these women. Lord, I pray that the young ladies of our church will grow up and be fierce women of God who know their Bibles, who are eager to share their faith, who want their lives to count. Lord, please give them courage. Let them be brave girls. Please give them strength. I pray that they will have wisdom. I pray that people know that they can, that these girls will grow up so that people will seek, out, seek them out, Lord, to see how they live their lives, to hear from them, Lord, to see their faithfulness. Lord, I pray that no matter what scars and wounds come their way, that they will never, ever let go of you. Lord God, please bless these young girls. Bless all of our children. I pray that we raise up an entire generation of people that will live for you no matter what. Lord God, for those that it's your will that they get married, Father. I pray that each one of them gets a godly spouse who will love you more than they love our kids. Put you first, Lord, and then be tremendous blessings to all the kids in our church. Father, you're so good. You stirred up within us, Lord, a desire to love you. It helps to love you ever more as the days pass. Father, help us never fall under the enchantment of the devil's lies, thinking that this world's all there is, thinking that the purpose is to live for ourselves, Lord. I pray that we're not so easily deceived. But Father, each and every day, walking in peace, rejoicing in your goodness and your love and your greatness, Lord, and that, Lord, each one of us would make your son Jesus Christ winsome to a lost and dying world. God, you're God that hears prayers. Thank you. Amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just uh, 
you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area. And I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.